All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today. Chris Riantai, Chief Technologist for the West Region at Red Hat. And today, uh, talk about security, state of mind, compliance, and vulnerability audits uh, for containers. Uh, first off, you know, in regards to what's going on in the industry, uh, this represents uh, a few years ago, there were over a billion data breaches. And here are just some of the marquee brands that were impacted by these breaches uh, in North America. And what was the uh, leading cause of these breaches? You know, first off, uh, employees were not taking proper uh, security measures in their environments. Uh, secondly, the cause was around outside breaches and then unpatched or unpatchable servers. Typically, I find when I talk with uh, IT groups that it's usually those one-off servers that are on older version uh, that were not patched in the, the root cause of the uh, infiltration. Also, internal attacks by employees, something that's uh, often uh, forgotten about. And so when I first joined Red Hat about 13 years ago, I would talk with uh, a lot of IT shops about security, what were their best practices that they were following. And I usually got a lot of blank stares uh, because their security policy was around the firewall, right? They set the policy on the firewall and that was their defense mechanism uh, for their environment. And with hybrid cloud, public or private clouds, it's really eliminating that wall and becoming an attack vector across multiple clouds now that simply cannot be defined by a physical uh, network firewall. And so the other point was is that most of these discussions were with the operations teams. Security was not uh, first and foremost on people's minds in the testing or in the development teams. And so the typical enterprise is really struggling between two vectors. One is innovation, right? How do they quickly innovate without impacting the overall execution of their corporation? In the real world, similar to the struggle at Ford versus Tesla, right? Ford is great at executing an idea at large scale. They took a concept of a car and they're able to mass produce it. However, their innovation engine is challenged. Where you have Tesla without any legacy built from the ground up, they're built for innovation, rapidly innovating. In fact, they're able to innovate greatly because they've innovated in the ability to deliver updates over the wire with software. However, they are having challenges around executing at scale, right? mass producing the vehicles. And so how do you achieve that balance? And so that's really the promise of DevOps, enabling a corporation to rapidly produce new software at scale through cultural improvements, process improvements, as well as technology. From a cultural perspective, really mirroring a lot of the attributes of a open source community, creating collaboration, transparency, and an openness across the organization, typically formed in a small teams that own a particular service or application from development into production, allowing for streamlined efficiency of the development and operation of that service. Also, secondly, process improvement. Rapidly being able to deliver and deploy new updates in an agile and a continuous environment in a matter of hours or days rather than weeks or months. And this impacts the business because they're able to rapidly innovate. Also, leveraging technology. Typically, early adopters of DevOps are embracing a lot of open source-based solutions, whether it's the underlying OS, the uh, infrastructure, or the development tooling. Right? Uh, what about security? Right? You have this fast-moving process the thought typically is, is that, wow, how do you make this secure? We have a manual process today. We have a manual approval process that takes days to uh, change control. I have a standby data center to test out this new change and then get feedback. How do I move to a DevOps environment that's rapidly moving yet still maintain security? And so that's why the evolution of DevOps into DevSecOps, embracing security end to end as a part of culture, so a security first mindset. Also in terms of process, integrating it in an automated way 
into the overall development process from dev into production. It's not just an operations concern. And then embracing some technology, some tooling to help automate the security uh, in your DevOps environment. So DevSecOps. And so what are the benefits of DevSecOps? First off, you know, reduce this risk of deploying uh, new updates and ensuring that they're secure and you don't have vulnerabilities or a breach of your policies. Also, lowering the overall costs, right? If your environment has a low number of issues, you're going to have a much more cost-effective environment because you're not have to change. Also, in terms of speed of delivery, the ability to rapidly deploy these updates at scale in an automated manner, and being able to react because there will be issues in a very responsive manner in a matter of minutes or hours uh, to any vulnerabilities. And we're going to do this through security automation, uh, process optimization, as well as continuous security improvement. Key part of DevOps is that continuous feedback and getting that to your development, your testers, your operations, and be able to pivot and change course uh, responsively. And so containers are a big part of the movement towards DevSecOps uh, because it enables the developer to package once and deploy anywhere. And it's a, really a culmination of this shift to microservices, decomposing that monolithic app into independent microservices allows you to quickly move and update a service rapidly without uh, having a huge bet of a monolithic app and the huge risk of potentially impacting the business of a failure. And then DevOps enabling the process of actually deploying that microservice qu quickly and rapidly into production across hybrid infrastructure. And so containers are a big part of that movement. And from a security perspective, they allow the developer to build their application or their service with all the immediate dependencies uh, within the container image. So I have everything that I need to, and I build it once in development on my laptop or shared infrastructure, and then it gets deployed in the test and the production as is. Right? I don't have to rebuild or reconfigure it as it moves from one phase to another, whether it's across public, private, virtual, or physical infrastructure. And so I can do that with a build file. It's a recipe, so I can reproduce that image uh, and be consistent every time it's built. I also can share that knowledge so I don't have to be the sole owner of that, and it's uh, reproducible down the road. Also, in terms of containers, the ability to ship and share the container image, uh, whether it's sharing it across dev test production or different environments. Uh, that provides the ability to have a single image that's the same across dev tests and production, and then also the ability to run that instance uh, across any type of infrastructure. Very similar to the Java world where you have a standardized Java file or jar format, and then a JVM for standard runtime. In the Docker world, you have a standard build file or standard image format and then running it across the standard Docker runtime, uh, whether it's Java, PHP, Go, et cetera, any language. So it's Polygon uh, versus Java. Secondly, uh, in terms of the application delivery via containers from a security perspective, the nice thing about uh, containers is that it also abstracts the developer from the underlying host. That frees them up to, from a security and operational perspective to have the freedom to actually pull in the components that they need uh, for their application and not be tied down by the policy at the host level. And this also allows the developer to have consistency of their application runtime across all their infrastructure. And so some of the key things when it comes to securing containers are first off around images, builds, registry, uh, CICD, integrating security into that process, as well as hardening your container host, which the uh, container instance would run on. And so we'll walk through all these. First off, uh, container image security. So as a best practice, uh, as you move to containers from a monolithic application, it's really to have uh, a separation of your code configuration and your data. Treat the container as immutable. 
right? So what does this mean? This means the actual container image should actually contain your code and the necessary dependencies, the middleware or the OS dependencies that it's necessary, and that gets built and put into the container image. When it comes to configurations and your data, that should actually be abstracted out uh, from the image, right? So that it remains immutable, so you can scale up, replace it very easily and efficiently. But also from a security perspective, uh, you may want to extract those configurations as well, such as passwords or your uh, private keys or public keys. And so in Kubernetes, if you're using that to manage your security environment, you could put it into a config map or a secret uh, for the passwords, for instance. And so that keeps it separate. And then when the container instance is launched, it may put it into a, an environment variable that your application uh, could then consume. Also, from a data perspective, if you have persistent data, you could leverage your container application platform's ability to provision uh, persistent storage or to leverage an external data service and make sure your data is being stored there. So the separation of your code, config, and your data. Uh, next thing is an important uh, part of the move from a monolithic to a microservice in a container is that traditionally, if you're developing a Java application, the developer is typically providing test and operations a jar file with their code. As you move to containers, that process will actually shift to delivering a container image. And what's inside this container image now is not only the jar or the application uh, from before, but also now it contains the actual runtime uh, that the Java application, in the case, would be the JVM, and then also the OS dependencies. So from a security perspective, who owns tracking when there's a security vulnerability, and who owns updating this in a container image? And so it's important uh, to have that ownership in a process to address that because there are ongoing security vulnerabilities for all the components that are being pulled into these container images. In this example, from left to right, you have a C, a Java, a Node.js, and a, a Perl slash PHP application. And the squares represent the different components that are getting pulled in as you build your container image. Uh, the little triangle has a number in it for some of those, and it indicates how many security errata notifications have been issued for that particular component. This is relative to RHEL 7.0 uh, Linux distribution. And so in the second column, you can see the JRE. It has a 66. So there's been 66 and counting security notifications for the JRE. So it's very important to uh, understand uh, that there are ongoing security vulnerabilities being released all the time, and I need to have a process which we'll talk about. Uh, the second thing is as you're running and starting up uh, container images in your environment, uh, you want to make sure that they're coming from a trusted source. Right? And you can address this by signing your images. Right? Therefore, you could have an automated process uh, before starting something in your production environment uh, to make sure that it has a known signature. Now let's talk about container builds. Uh, so we talked about the separation of responsibility uh, for the different layers in the container image. Uh, if you're using a build image, uh, you may want to uh, separate the ownership. So in the current environment, for instance, I have a operations team that owns the Linux kickstart file for the base OS image. And then I have a middleware team that owns delivery of the middleware layer. Maybe it's a, a tarball. And then thirdly, I have the application developers who are delivering a jar file. Right, those are all different uh, syntaxes, text files, or languages um, in how I'm delivering the component. With a container, I can now define those layers with the same build file, right? So I can collaborate easily, and I can uh, share and build from the same type of uh, uh, file. And so with the developer, I'm defining my OS in the Docker file. I can go ahead and own the security notifications and updates for that layer. 
And so my overall application will be the combination of the OS, the middleware, and then the application layer. Yet, I still have the separation of responsibility from a security perspective. And so some of the best practices when it comes to container builds is to treat this build file as a blueprint. Right? This is a recipe for how the image was built, so down the road I can reproduce it uh, if I need to. Also, you know, when you are building and configuring an image, don't go launching in SSHing into the instance, make changes, and then save it, because then you no longer have a recipe or a blueprint uh, for how that was built. Uh, also, in terms of version control, make sure that your version control, checking these into Git, and uh, have a consistent process around that. It allows you also to collaborate and share and reuse. Uh, be explicit with the versions in the build file so that it uh, is reproducible. And then make sure you're aware that as you create a, uh, a run command, it's generating a new layer, so uh, that will add some extra hep to the uh, image. In terms of the registry security, here's some best practices around that. You know, what inside the container matters? We did a scan of the public uh, Docker registry and found that 64% of the images had a higher medium uh, known security issue. Typically, as I talk with organizations, the development team starts out using containers. They're pulling down from the public repo. Eventually, they, they run in a uh, production-like environment, yet operations is totally unaware uh, that they've been pulled publicly and that they have security vulnerabilities because there's not a standard process for scanning these in the development cycle. Right. And so the first step typically uh, in an organization in their adoption of containers is actually setting up a public or a private registry within the enterprise. And this allows uh, the operations team to kind of create a trusted repo for containers within the enterprise. Another advantage is that when it comes to an issue down the road with a legacy version, you can go back and have all the dependencies in your enterprise to recreate that. So if you're building an image and it depends on third-party components and they're stored on a public repo, how do you know that that version or that dependency will be there in 12 or 18 months down the road? Right, so it's a good practice to make sure that all the dependencies that you're uh, necessary to build an image are actually stored into your private registry. Uh, now let's talk about CI with containers. Right? So typically in the DevOps world, you have the continuous integration, uh, continuous delivery pipeline, CI uh, part, involves the developer checking in their source and to Git, and then there's a continuous build where you're building the container image, right? First off, you take that source, build some RPMs, and then the RPMs uh, produce the container images, and you store that uh, artifact into the uh, private registry that within your enterprise. And then when it comes to deploying that microservice out to the container environment, you pull that image from the registry and deploy at scale. So from a security perspective, how do you integrate security into the continuous integration aspect? So first off, the operations and your developers, you'll be using the build file to define the image uh, using version control systems such as Git, uh, checking in uh, so that you have a record of that and you can reproduce it. But also, you want to move towards the ability to have reproducible builds for your container images as, though, as well. And so you can accomplish this uh, by leveraging a build image uh, that's version controlled as well. Uh, so you can go back in time and you know exactly what build image. But also, by using a build image, you will compile your application. And rather than putting that application within the build image, it'll create a s separate uh, artifact, the container image, that's outside of the build environment. So your resulting artifact does not have that build environment with, within it. Right? So therefore, it's lightweight, uh, a smaller f f footprint to attack, as well as it's uh, reproducible as well. And so reproducible builds. And then once that is built, you can store it in your image registry. 
build once and then distribute across your environments for testing and then roll out to production. Uh, another best practice is as part of your continuous integration is to actually insert a security scanning phase into your CI process. Every time you build an image, go ahead and put it through a scan to validate that there are no, no uh, security vulnerabilities and that it conforms to your security policy. Another way to go about this is to use a private registry. Uh, when you upload that image, it generates an automated scan as well, triggers that. Uh, so how would you go about automating these scans? There are a variety of tools out there, whether it's Anchor or Black Duck. In this case, I'm going to talk about OpenScan, which is a uh, open source, uh, freely available tooling to help you with security vulnerability scans as well as scans for uh, security policy. So OpenScap is a set of tooling and first off it provides content. Right? A list of known best practices in terms of hardening uh, your container image. It also provides tips for virtual or physical infrastructure as well. And then also content around known security vulnerabilities. With this content, you can then leverage the tooling, uh, the CLI or a daemon, to actually automate the scans of your container instances or a container image, as well as virtual and physical infrastructure. And the result is that you get a report showing you any known issues uh, for security policy or security vulnerabilities. And then you can rectify uh, the issue with a remediation script in terms of the security policy or the security vulnerability. And so let's drill down into some of the details for OpenScap. First off, use case may be, hey, I want to scan for compliance. You know, our password quality requirements set or obsolete services like Telnet uh, enabled. Is OpenSSH properly configured? You know, is slash temp on a separate partition? And so I can use the OSCAP uh, command line tool to run an automated scan. And it's going to check, in this case, uh, the image to see if it conforms with my security policy. And so once the uh, scan is completed, it'll actually generate this evaluation report and showing me the different errors. And in this case, I can see that there are actually 34 checks passed and 33 that failed. Uh, there were three high, and so I can drill down. In this case, I can see all the different checks and whether it was a success or a failure. And then with each check, I can actually drill down even further. In this case, I want to take a look at the set password strength minimum digit characters. And I can see that this instance or this image failed, and I get a script at the bottom here that I could run against it to correct that configuration. Right. Another use case is to scan for known vulnerabilities. So, you know, what RPMs need updating? What is the criticality of the vulnerability? What is the vulnerability and what CVEs have not been applied yet to this particular container image? And so, again, I can run a scan here. I'm going to go ahead and run the OSCAP vulnerability scan against this image. And it will generate a report showing me all the uh, known issues. I can drill down into a detailed list and then actually apply and update uh, the new RPMs to that container image. Uh, another use case is for containers specifically. Uh, I can run this to see if the Docker image is compliant, has it been patched, is the container compliant or the container patched. So I can run this at rest or a running instance. And I just install the uh, Docker component, and I can run the scan against this instance. Also, there's a workbench tool to allow me to customize my security policy. So I could leverage a baseline default policy and then customize it, in whether adding or subtracting some of the checks. I can also integrate this with my uh, physical or virtual machine uh, installations of Linux by using the Anaconda add-on. And therefore, from the get-go, I can make sure that that instance conforms 
with the security policy that I have defined for my organization. Okay. Also, lastly, you talk about containers delivery with containers. One of the key differences here is instead of passing a jar file from dev into production, I'm passing the container image. Right? I'm not rebuilding it, but I build it once and then I put it through QA, staging, and production, and that contains my application, the OS dependencies, as well as the middleware dependencies. And so in a CD process over on the right side, you know, how, when there is a security issue in production, how do I go about updating that component? Typically today, I'll just go in and patch the production server. But in a container world, you actually want to go back to development and regenerate that application to version N plus one that contains that fix and then push it through the entire process of testing and then roll out to production. And so how do I deploy at scale? No longer do I have a single physical box or 10 VMs. I may have 100 container instances. Right? And these are all individual microservices distributed across my infrastructure. And so I want to be able to take a version one that's out there in production and be able to rapidly respond by deploying an updated version without risking a failure for the overall environment. And I can use this by ver uh, leveraging various automated deployment strategies, such as a rolling update. In this case, I have version one out in production. The developers found an issue, a security issue, and they produced version 1.2, put it through CI testing. And the rolling update, I can gradually roll out this new version to production. And as I gain confidence, I can increase the number of nodes that are updated into my environment. So that's the rolling update. Another choice I have is a blue-green deployment. Right. The blue environment may be up installed with version one. There's a known security issue. Rather than replace my existing environment, I'm going to go ahead and set up a, a separate green environment, a logical environment. It's a mirror of my production environment, my blue environment, so that I can quickly move over to the green environment. And then also, it's pretty much a mirror of my current environment so I can deploy with confidence. And if there is an issue, I could actually roll back. And so here I have version one. And I'm going to go ahead and put in version 1.2 in my green environment. I am routing all my traffic to the blue uh, as my green environment is deployed side by side. I'm doing my testing and then I can actually switch the software load balancer over to uh, version 1.2. The downside of this is I need more infrastructure uh, to accomplish this, but the positive is actually now I have a high confidence that this version is a mirror of my production environment, so reduce the number of issues, and I can quickly test in a production-like environment and deploy, and if there was an issue, I could do a rollback uh, to that version 1.0. Okay. Uh, so how would I go about automating the updates? Well, if I have a production instance out there that's built on uh, layered images, my OS, my middleware, and then the top layer being my application, I could actually monitor my private registry to see if those dependencies are updated with a new version of the image. And then trigger an automated build, deployment, and rollout of that image update. Right? And so as a developer, I don't have to worry about was the OS image updated? Was the middleware image updated that I depend on? My operations team is tracking that and rebuilding the OS layer. My middleware team is tracking middleware security issues and updating that. And then with this automation, I could generate new versions of my service or application based on any updates in the private registry of those dependencies. And I can have that as automated as I want. Uh, that could actually be an automation of my CI CD pipeline and then leveraging a, uh, a rolling update or a blue green deployment in an automated fashion to push out that new security update. Uh, container host security. 
Uh, so just some best practices around the host that you're going to run these container instances on. You know, Linux is a key part of it, enabling security in a containerized environment. You have C groups providing quality of service, uh, namespaces pr providing logical separation so that, for instance, the root user in a container is not this, a root user as a host. Uh, that's important if there's a security vulnerability so you don't have access to all the uh, containers on that node as well as the host. And then SC Linux provides mandatory access controls so that a, even a root process has to explicitly state what objects that can have access to on the system, such as the configuration file or slash 10. And then SecCom uh, allows you to reduce the uh, capabilities of a process with the kernel so that it doesn't have full-blown kernel access. Uh, and read-only allows you to do read-only mounts uh, so that you don't have right access to file systems. So just some best practices. Also, don't run as root your uh, processes uh, or your container instances. Also, limit the SSH access. If you need information from your container instance, uh, create an API call. Um, use namespaces. Define resource quotas so you don't have the noisy neighbor uh, issue. Leverage C groups so that it restrains the, the container instance uh, in terms of network CPU and disk consumption and memory. Uh, make sure you're enabling lauding from an audit trail and applying uh, security around it, not just to your container instance, but also to the host. Right? And apply uh, security context and subcomp filters uh, so that you can reduce the capabilities that process has on the uh, uh, system. Uh, in terms of uh, making sure that you're making good progress in your uh, evolution of DevSecOps and your adoption in the enterprise, uh, here are some things to track. First off is compliance score, uh, deployment frequency, lead time, uh, deployment failure rate, and the MTR, so that when you do have an issue, you're able to respond uh, quickly, and then certainly uh, be tracking the overall service availability uh, from a business perspective. All right, uh, so that's all I had today. If you have any questions, feel free to come down afterwards. Uh, you can also email me at cvantine at redhat.com. Uh, I'm also on Twitter as well. And then tomorrow I have a couple of sessions going into a little deeper dive on some of this uh, from a Kubernetes perspective. Thank you very much. We're done. Any questions for Chris? Going once, going twice. All right, that's a wrap. So that was our last talk.